Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Tandy Boxing Podcast with me, Tony Mega, and I'm joined by renowned boxing trainer, John Tandy. In today's show, we recap the Hayden Mori heavyweight action from Saturday night at London's O2 Arena and talk about whether the late dropping of Shane Singleton from the undercard was justified or whether more should have been done to provide Singleton with a short notice replacement of John O'Donnell. From the United States, we have a roundup of not one, but two heavyweight world title fights from the current USBO heavyweight champion, Joshua Too Tough Tufty. And Lee Banjo Markham, who fought to a thrilling 10 round draw against Frank Bullioni last May, talks to John about his ups and downs in 2015. Thanks very much for joining us on the Tandy Boxing Podcast. I do hope you enjoy the show. Good morning, John. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good. Um, interesting night of boxing last night, so yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, you, let's talk first about the uh, Hay Demori fight. It didn't last very long, but can you sum the fight up for us just briefly? <laughs> very briefly, yeah. Um, I think uh, David was struggling for his range initially, but that didn't take long to get into, get, get him into control. Um, Demori just looked to have a match for me. Um, he looked a little bit slow, a little bit nervous. Um, two lead hook right hands kind of glazed the mark and then uh, it was a counter to a jab that followed by uh, followed by a left uppercut followed by another right hand and uh, Demori went to sleep unfortunately so yeah it wasn't a, it wasn't a great fight no it wasn't but it looked like a, it looked like quite a bad knockout didn't it originally he stayed down for a, for a good few minutes to get oxygen and, and ended up leaving and going to hospital but thankfully he's okay he sent a, a tweet out from his hospital bed with his family yeah, around him, and he, and he, yeah, you saw that. He said he, he's okay and he just needs to rest, which is which is fantastic news. And I hope he has a, a nice rest in Croatia. I know he likes it over there, so that's good. What do we think of David Hayes' performance? Did we see uh, enough of him to see to see whether he's still got the magic? Not really. Um, he still looked like he had decent hand speed. He's obviously a lot heavier than when he when he fought last time. I think he's about seventeen pounds heavier. Um, but he looked good for it, to be honest. He looked uh, muscular, he looked in shape, um, he, was, he, he controlled the range. But again, it's very difficult when you don't have much in front of you um, to, to judge where he's at. Um, Demore, unfortunately, wasn't really at that level, uh, despite his record. Um, and he kind of came in a little bit slow, a little bit nervous. And uh, Hay made him pay. But, I mean, you can't fault David Hay, but you can't really tell where he's at from that, I don't think. No, he'll say he feels good. He said after the fight that he feels good. He feels in good shape. So um, there's every sign there that he's going to go on and achieve what he said he's going to do. And that's win a world title. Yeah, to be honest, I mean, he's probably got a better... Even though he's older, he's still pretty fresh. I think we talked about this last week, the fact that he hasn't had a lot of tough fights. And that extra 17 pounds, if he can carry it well and still got the speed, which it looked like he did, it it could be beneficial to him when he fights the big guys. Absolutely. Now, w- what about the undercard? I know we've mentioned in our first pod that it didn't look could particularly stand out or particularly good. I had a tweet last week from a guy called Tim, uh, that's at Mr. Derma one and he wrote on that that he'd noticed that on the Dave website they'd written an article which had mentioned the celebrities attending, but not the strong undercard. Now, I thought, well, that's fair enough. That, that's, that's Dave. They're, they're new to boxing. They're appealing, or they're trying to appeal to a wider audience. We saw um, Benedict Cumberbatch in the crowd. What do you make of the undercard, and particularly the way Shane Singleton was treated by being booted off the undercard at, at just uh, two or three days' notice um, after John O'Donnell pulled out? Yeah, I mean... <sighs> Again, it's a learning curve for them, I think. I think the way that Singleton was, was treated wasn't good. Um, obviously, there was a problem with Jenna Donnell. Don't know the full details of that, but from an interview with um, Shay Singleton, he, he mentioned that Jenna Donnell left a message at the gym rather than tell anyone. He'd say he trained for the day and then left a message saying that he, was, uh, he, wasn't, he, didn't, he didn't fancy the fight, which is not very, not very good. 
from a, from a TV point of view, you would then expect, as Shane Singleton is the main support, um, to look for an opponent for him. But again, they they probably weighed it up, saying what was the point in getting him a fight that against uh, a nobody and somebody that's going to dance around with him for for five or six rounds. Was there any point? Would it affect the TV viewing? I don't know, but it's not a way you treat treat your fighters. I don't think. Well, it was the the fact that he'd got at short notice. He took the fight at two and a half weeks to help out David Hay with the with the undercard. Uh, yeah. It was a fifty fifty fight, and and it obviously I, I I can feel for him. He feels quite aggrieved by that. Uh, he's obviously um, got tickets and he's got people organised. They've got they've booked hotels and travel down, and it's just been just been stitched up, hasn't he? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. I mean, that sums it up. Unfortunately, there are a lot of boxing is like that. Um, it's just it's disappointing for him. It's disappointing for all his fans. It's quite, probably cost him a lot of money. There's probably 15, 20 grand gone into it that's been that's been wasted. I mean, people are not going to travel down just to see David Hayes flatten somebody in two minutes. The undercard was very limited. There was a couple of journeyman fights. I mean, Richard Horton probably like a half-decent fight. But Wadi Wadi Camacho was on there as well. He he limped through a, a journeyman, um, so you're not going to travel all that way unless you're there to support your guy. And he wasn't there, so I think it's very harsh, to be honest. Over at the Barclays Center in New York last night were two heavyweight world title fights. The WBC champion Deontay Wilder spectacularly knocked out Poland's Arthur Spilska in the round nine of their very cagey contest to keep hold of his title. And the IBF found a new champion in Charles Martin, who beat Vlasislav Klaskov after he twisted his knee and was forced to quit. Joining us on the line now from America is the current USBO heavyweight champion, Joshua Too Tough Tufty. And he watched both fights. Joshua, it's a real honour and a pleasure to have you on with us. Tell us a little bit about last night's action, if you would. You know, the Glaskov Martin fight was the opener to the show. And really, uh, some, some good production that went on. Um, I had uh, some reservations going into the fight um, as far as from a spectator's point of view. I know both of these guys. I've, I've seen both of them. I had a fight with Martin planned that never fell through or that kind of fell through. But, um, you know, Glaskov is a solid fighter. He's, he seems to be very consistent. But he's kind of like the impression over here in the States is that he's got this guardian angel watching over his shoulder because he's been in three or four fights now that uh, just like one of the ones with my one of my other good buddy Steve Cunningham you know most everybody thought that Steve pretty much had that fight hands down and Glasgow took the decision far and away so um, but you know I know the guy is a nice guy good solid fighter and probably his biggest attribute is that he's consistent he consistently does things that are good yeah. um, so and then Martin coming in I felt like it was a bigger wild card he was a lot bigger a lot more powerful but he'd never really been tested um, so he he didn't have any household names he didn't have anybody on his card the biggest guy he'd fought was Joey Jojoinko mm. um, who's you know pretty big filial fighter over here but um, but you know that was when Joey was out of shape and wasn't really practicing hard and and most everybody knew it at the time as well so martin didn't really get much credit for beating him as say he would have if he fought joey now Mm -hmm. um and no no real you know disrespect meant to either fighter but as far as you know the the fight went it wasn't an incredibly exciting fight you could tell both the guys were nervous both of them were kind of getting into their pace and then early on in the fight uh, Glaskov, it looked like he dislocated his knee and tore his ACL or MCL, something like that, and wasn't able to continue on. Um, so it, it looked was, to me uh, like he he he, um, he he pulled it or he did something to it, but he just twisted his knee. Uh, he went down before the, the fight was finished, but got back up again and carried on. But it was only a few seconds after that he he had to he had to stop, didn't he? Yep. Yeah, and, you know, I think what happens sometimes when you're the shorter guy, you, you have to kind of lunge in at an awkward angle, and doing that with the right hand and then trying to pull out, it looked like the first time he did that, his foot kind of got stuck on maybe a rough spot of the mat or something, and mm. it, it twisted it, just like you said. 
and that could have maybe started the tear or started something going on in there, and then a few seconds later just finished the job over. Uh, if you saw, did you see the video replay? Yeah. That, it looked really kind of nasty. What is needed in slow motion? Yeah. So and and like I said, I know Glasgow. The fight wasn't off to a, a fantastic start, but he's definitely not one to hop out of a fight for um, anything but an, an absolutely fantastic reason. So. You know, it had to have been hurting really bad if he was bowing out. Yeah, I don't think anybody's saying that it was anything other than a genuine injury. So, um, so, so Charles Martin got lucky then, did he? He's now the IBF World Heavyweight Champion. What, what do you think's next for him? Where's he going to go with it? You know, I think I think he's going to have pretty much the pick of the world in the heavyweight division right now because nobody really respects him. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I give him credit due. He showed up to a tough fight against a fighter with way more experience and way more credibility. And, you know, he did what he was supposed to do. And, you know, regardless of the circumstances, he still won. But you could even tell from the announcers over here that everybody was very surprised that Charles Martin is now the heavyweight champion. So I think pretty much all the other heavyweight champions and all the number one contenders are going to be more than willing to fight him because in their mind he's going to be the easiest way to a piece of the heavyweight crowd. How about Deontay Wilder? It was a spectacular knockout. It was that short right hand right on the chin of Spilska, who up until then looked like he was doing quite well in the fight. Yeah, man. You know, Spilka, I, um, I, I've really become a fan over Spilka over time because he started off as, in my mind, kind of like a hooligan, and he's really matured. I knew... From interviews with him, he was trying to change his life around. And so over the years, he's kind of matured into the fighter he is now. I think his defense and the head movement and footwork looked fantastic last night. Mm-hmm. Definitely gave Wilder some fits as far as finding him with the big right hand, which, you know, of course, he eventually did in spectacular fashion. I was actually looking down to take a note, <laughs> um, and I looked up, and he was on the ground. I was like, whoa, that <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, and the, you know the replay when he came in with that trying to land that big left Wilder just I mean you got to hand it to Wilder that that right hand was timed and aimed fantastically and he's just got such amazing power at any point he can just end the fight. So do you think Wilder Wilder getting a little bit of stick because the fight was quite even and and uh, his star with his these high open hands. Could it be that he was just playing a patient game, just waiting until the right moment? Yeah, it could be that. You know, I kind of <laughs> um, you know, get the sense from Wilder um, that he's learning on the job. And to be honest with you, when, when I first heard of Wilder, I was not that huge of a fan because watching his early tapes, all he seemed to have was physical attributes and a lot of punching power. Um, and everybody was touting him to be the next best thing. Over the time, he's kind of proved me wrong in the sense that he's got the work ethic to gain the skill that he was lacking at first. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and in this fight, you know, he, he didn't start off very pretty, and it seemed like as the fight went on, he was learning and gaining range, um, figuring out his footwork, dealing with an awkward southpaw. So I think he adapted very well. But yeah, I was, I was uh, along with the commentators and a lot of people on Twitter and Facebook, you know, noticing that the start of the fight he was looking very sloppy. Um, yeah, and, his, his work rate was was quite low as well, wasn't it, at the start of the fight? And he didn't really improve so much. He just seemed he just seemed to get a little bit more more confident or more comfortable with the fact that he was that he was the bigger guy and he was able to keep Spilka for long periods away from him. Exactly. Once he started landing that jab, the pace of the fight kind of took. I actually gave Spilka the first three rounds uh, pretty handily, the second two, the second and the third. Um, I thought Wilder won the fourth and the fifth, but then it was back and forth up until the point that uh, Spilka got caught. But as soon as he started landing his jab, I felt like Wilder, like you said, got comfortable, started settling in. And that, you know, made it more difficult for Spilka 
to push him backwards. Wilder definitely does not like going back. He doesn't like the double jab. Yeah. Um, you know, so we'll have to see how he does with somebody like, um, you know, Anthony Joshua or somebody like that who's who's able to have the same physicality as he does, but also put together the combos that Spilka was. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Talking of um, possible opponents for Wilder, Tyson Fury was at ringside uh, for the fight and didn't waste any time in jumping into the ring and <laughs> hijacking an interview with uh, with Wilder. Did you see that? What did you make about that? <laughs> I saw it. You know, when they called him up there, I was like, y'all are going to regret that. <laughs> you know, Tyson Fury is uh, one of the few fighters I haven't had the opportunity to meet. But he seems like a very interesting character, and um, it seems very consistent in uh, his ability to steal the show and do something that is uh, going to make the headlines. So my hat's off to him in that respect. But um, but yeah, you know, I think um, I think it, it was a lot of posturing from both of those guys. I, I doubt honestly that they'll both fight each other anytime soon. Maybe later in the year, early next year. Um, but, you know, I think with Tyson Fury having to fight Vladimir again, and there's a lot of talk of Deontay Wilder fighting Povetkin next, you know, they both got really tough hurdles to overcome before they look at each other. Yourself, Joshua, you're, you're, you're an active heavyweight at the moment. You've got a 19-1 and one record. Do you, you must look at that and think, uh, I'd like a bit of that action. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, I, uh, I'm, I'm very good friends, friends with Vladimir. I've been to... Uh, several of his sparring camps and helped him prepare for a couple fights. Um, but you know, I I'm really excited about the the potential of having the heavyweight being moved around and shaken up so much as a division. We've had some great fighters on the way up now. Um, with you know the guys over the pond, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. With, with you all over there, um, you know, so Dillian White's a great friend of mine. You know, he, he proved himself to be an avid contender in his fight with Joshua, who's, you know, everybody already knew was a contender. I mean, there's a lot of people out there. Um, I was recently in sparring camp with um, Ortiz, and, man, that guy is just a fantastic southpaw. He knocked out Bryant Jennings recently in a seven-round contest. Uh, to gain, you know, uh, a pretty high slot up there, if not a number one contendership. Yeah. So it's it's a really, you know, a year ago everybody was saying the division is dead, and now it's got this new sense of life pumped into it. Unfortunately, at the expense of my good friend Vladimir. Yeah. But I think he'll have, you know, him him and Fury will have a good rematch coming up, and that'll that'll be a a tough competition for both of them. Appreciate your time today, mate. Take it easy. Until next time. Yes, sir. I'll talk to you then. Also in action last night over in Munich, Germany, were the Kraft brothers who were looking to make history in Germany by being the first brothers to win a world title on the same night. Now, this is an event promoted by a former cruiserweight world title challenger to Johnny Nelson, by the way, uh, Alexander Povek... uh, Not Povekin, but Petkovic. (laughs) He also had uh, Alexander Dimitrenko, a friend from his uh, former fighting days, on the bill. Another guy on the bill who's been described as the German Lomachenko by uh, Petkovic was Harik Brebaham. He knocked out Ahmed Sisek for the vacant German light welterweight title, uh, which leads us on to the Kraft brothers, uh, James and Tony Kraft. Yeah, what, did okay. you, what did you make of it? I thought they looked quite, quite useful, the two, the two brothers, considering their ages as well. Um, I mean, you got to, you got to take into account they they had a large size advantage over their opponents. Frank Albert, the guy that fought Tony, um, got blasted out in a round by Jeremy Cox over here. Jeremy Cox was once a welterweight. He's now fighting at middleweight, stroke super middleweight. Um, Frank Albert's fought a lot of middleweight, super middleweight. So he had, I think, Kraft had quite a lot of advantages to still go seven rounds doesn't really stand out as a prospect for me to be honest no okay um box fairly well but um you have to question seven rounds with somebody like albert if you if you're if you're gonna go somewhere if you're gonna win the world title i think you've got to be in a little bit more convincingly than that but you don't see any potential in the craft brothers in then um john i think they've got a lot of development as you said they're young um they've still got time um 
But yeah, I mean, they were they were in against pretty limited opposition. I mean, again with James and against Peter Auric, um who's basically a light middleweight. Who I think uh, Freisenbutz knocked him out in two rounds. Um, Peter Auric, yeah, at one point. Um, yeah, I mean, again, you don't always look for the knockouts. You look at how they perform. Technically, they're not too bad. Um, let's see how the developers they get their their man strength. Okay, we should wait and see. <laughs> Now, middleweight Lee Banjo Markham started 2015 at 13 and 1 with 10 wins on the bounce. The year started well with a second round TKO win over Louis Van Poch, which lined up a crack at Jameen Smile for the vacant English title. Markham very narrowly lost out by a split decision, but by May was in the ring again facing Frank Bullioni for his WBO super middleweight strap at Wembley Arena. After 10 pulsating rounds of boxing, the judges concluded upon a draw leading calls for an immediate rematch. However, Bullioni moved on to a world title fight with Chudnov and Markham, a Commonwealth shot against Luke Blackledge, ultimately losing another very close but unanimous decision. John caught up with Lee and asked him for his thoughts on the loss to Smile. Everyone else who watched the fight uh, thought I won it, but as you know, like boxing don't always go your way, so there's not much you can do about it. Obviously, left a bit of a bit of taste in my mouth. I've, I've well thought I won it, not just I thought, but even after wave fire, I deserved to win it a bit. Obviously, being the home fire, I thought it was just yeah, no brainer. Sure. Um, uh, like, like I said, it is where well, it's just boxing, just get on with it. And then, obviously, off, off the back of that, I've offered the um, Frank fight. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I suppose with the, with the Frank Bogliani fight, they kind of took you thinking you'd be not an easy, easy, easy task, but. Um, yeah, more I think more, a, it's more so because I'm not really big enough to uh, suit middleweight, really. Like, I should be a middleweight, and obviously Frank's a very big suit middleweight, and it's, it's sort of a no-brainer. For but you for, give him a bit of a but, shot. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. I think um, I give quite a few people a bit, bit of a shot. Yeah. But, um, Again, yeah, I mean, another uh, fight that you could have quite easily walked yeah, away with a victory. I, I, think, I think I could have... Quite, I could have edged that, like watching it back a few times and stuff, and you know you could give it my way, but um, I think the draw was quite a fair result because it was. I think it's a lot closer than the, the Smiley fight. Yeah. Um, so I think like it's, it's one of the good fights, and no one really deserved to lose. And I think the draw was like a fair result, but I think if you could if you could have tilted anyway, you could have tilted it towards me. Yeah, um, no, definitely. But, yeah, a draw ain't the end of the world, and obviously I've obviously had the, uh, lost before that. Yeah. Um, and then off, off the back of that, I got offered the uh, Luke Blackledge fight. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, to be honest, I thought you were going in fav- favourite for that one. I mean, um, I don't know if people had different ideas, but I, th- I no, thought that I, was out of your last couple of opponents. It was probably the easiest fight you had. But uh, did he surprise yeah. you a little bit? or? Yeah. Uh, no, I think, I know it's, it's so easy to sit here and say, oh, could have, would have, should have. But... Um, I, it's criminal to say it, but um, I won up for the, I won up for the fight. I know it's Commonwealth title and stuff, but I was doing it because the opportunity was there and took it. But yeah. in that time in the actual career, I felt like I loved boxing a little bit, and I wanted to, I wanted to like obviously with the uh, the smiley loss and all that. I felt like I loved it, and I wanted to have a bit of a break. But right. obviously, I can work every day, and I, got, I was getting paid a decent amount of money, and that's how I could, it's be. I couldn't say no to it. No, it's coming come the wrong time. Coming the wrong time in life, personally. But in saying that, I, I, I wasn't really up for it. Like training wise, yeah. when I was down the phone, I was just trying, trying to make artists to win. So I was never doing anything other than that. But um, yeah, training wise, I wasn't really up for it. But when I got uh, second round, mm-hmm. again, I said, it's excuses a little bit. I'm not saying I would have beaten for dinner, but where I got nutted in the second round, got clash of heads. I had that great big golf ball coming at me, head, yeah, and it's is agony like even when I had my hands up I was punching through it and it's really got full some grief but saying that even if I didn't have that I might I, it probably would have been the same result so it's not, I'm not taking anything away from the last I just, I just think I would have done a lot better if I didn't have that yeah early, but. For a, from a trainer's point of view I mean you, you, you fight with Frank Bogler and you use the angles quite nicely you were, you were spinning off your shots with yeah. the Blackledge fight it did look you were a little bit Dan, flat you were kind of standing yeah, in front the, of him a little bit too the, long the, and to the words that I'm at then I was Flat as a pancake, like, especially watching it back. I, I don't even watch it back, I'm really embarrassed. Like, I think it's just like really, really bad performance for me. And mm. the thing is, I, it's, it's the first time I really realised it. That that's the first time I've gen- genuinely thought I've lost as a pro, obviously. Yeah. And it's because 
because I was flat, because I was uh, because I was so poor. I don't think it's because I lost to the better man. Um, which yeah, is, no. uh, a bit frustrating to say. I think I could have done. It. Not saying again. I don't want to say I'd beat him in this and the other, but I think I would have, I've definitely done a lot better for once. Yeah, no, um, no, I agree. Well, um, well, I, I, come up in two, two, <coughs> two hard fights as well. I was a bit flat. You know, I needed a bit, of, a bit more time out. Yeah, well, you've kind of had that now. So I mean, you've kind of learned a lot from last year, and you're in a decent yeah. position still. Um, from what I've spoke to you earlier, you plan on dropping back to middleweight. Yeah, um, does that take just, um, out a, a rematch with Frank Bogliani? Is that is that not going to be yeah, on the cards does, anymore? Yeah, so from what I've heard, he's going up to light heavyweight now. So, oh uh, wow, that's definitely out of the equation. Unless you yeah. want to meet so midway, I'd be more than happy to do that. But right, where he's like, where the day well, I've had twenty four hour weigh The day of the contest, I've been like twelve six heaviest, and um, from what I've heard, the Smiley he, he was like thirty and a half stone. I just don't think I'm big enough. At the way, and I should be, I should be fighting eleven half time really, and then weighing in just over twelve on a day of fight. Yeah. Uh, Have you got any um, any targets in midway? Obviously, there's uh, Nick Blackwell's current UK uh, this, British I champion. Think I'd love, obviously, I'd love that fight. Yeah. I'll take it tomorrow. But, um, obviously, I can't. I've got to prove myself at midway and work yeah. work well up a little bit. Um, there's obviously so many good fighters out there midweight. Maybe more so the super midweight domestic. Yeah, stuff. probably. I mean, we've got a good, a good group of uh, British fighters. I mean, Andy Lee, Billy Joe Saunders, Christian Eubank Jr. Exactly. They're all they're all excelling. So I mean, it is a tough division. But if you, are, yeah. from my point of view, again, if you're at the right weight, you're performing yeah. a lot better. You're a lot stronger at middleweight. And yeah, I've get, always seen it's all about levels. I've always seen yourself like a British level fighter, and uh, obviously there's people like said the Saunders who are obviously world level. You're yeah. just below that European, but I think British level. Anyone at British level, I think I'll learn. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be pretty confident beating them. So, no, I look One forward to seeing time, it, man. I think your your next Sorry. fight's at the Prince Regent Hotel in Chigwell on the third of February. Uh, any news yeah. of the opponent or anything yet? No, well, to be honest, it's only going to be a journey because, that, like, you know, it'll work. A tune-up fight, paper. get back in the winning, winning yeah, round. Yeah, exactly. Not that I'll have a little break and jump back in there, but yeah, uh, like you know, as it works, I've got two. Lost and draw on paper, so I need to go away and just get like a win under my belt, and then, do you know what I mean? Then I, I can get back in the mixing, and I don't think if, if I was to get offered a title fight, now, I don't think I'd get. I don't think I'd sanction it because because my last three fights, you know. Right. Okay. But, well, I, don't, I, might, I might be wrong, but I've got to go away, and get a win. It'd probably only be a journeyman or something. And, okay. But uh, will I like, tickets and stuff? How do we get hold of them? Do we do we go through the promoter? Yeah, just come contact, to you. contact me. I'm on, I'm on yeah I'm on social media and. Um, uh, social media and uh, obviously my phone number if, if you know, I want to but yeah just contact me and I've got tickets for myself so alright brilliant oh well good luck for 2016 I mean I've got, I've got my fingers crossed I've seen what you can do in the gym and uh, I'd love to yeah. and obviously in the ring too I mean you've been fighting a way above what you you naturally should be so at middleweight I can see you really tearing it up and I look forward to seeing it yeah mate. hopefully hopefully mate yeah <laughs> alright well good luck for 2016 and we'll, okay, we'll see you soon mate ok moving on to the news the WBA have ordered that Quig or Frampton the winner of that fight obviously to face Rigondo for their belt but the IBF at the same time order Shingo Wake to face the winner for their belt John if you're the winner of the fight, if you're Frampton or Quig and you win your next fight, which belt do you drop? Um, I think it's a tough one. I think um, the IBF and the WBA are obviously highly regarded belts. Um, you have to look in who's the, sens- who's the most sensible fight. I mean, you're going to go for a guy, Shingo Wake, who's uh, 19 wins, 14 losses, two draws. Um, not really fought at a high level, mainly fought in Japan. I think he's never fought outside Japan. Um, it's a little bit of an awkward southpaw, but it's got to be an easier fight than somebody like Rigandau. Rigandau's obviously won a world title in his seventh fight. He's 475 and 12 as an amateur. Um, two Olympic gold medals plus a, another batch of all sorts of gold medals. Yeah. Um, realistically, um, do you want that fight now or would you rather go for Shingo Wake? Uh, personally, as their manager and moving them forward, Wake's got to be the, the obvious choice. Yeah, if they're forced to drop the belt, that is, of course, they might come to an arrangement. I think that you can always negotiate, can't you, for, um, for for unification fights? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, Regan Dow deserves it. Um, Regan Dow was obviously stripped of his title. Um, he's done nothing wrong. He's 16 no. R- Regan Dow is obviously very tough to fight. He's, he never gets hit very much, and he's a good mover. Um, he's got some power himself, so he's a tough, tough, tough opponent. Also in the news this week, Frank Warren said that he received an offer for Liam Smith to fight Canelo Alvarez. Is that a good fight for Smith to take at this time? Maybe at a catch weight? Um, you, you have to say, I mean, he's won his world title now. He's, he's going to start progressing. That's a massive step up in class for him. Um, it's one of them fights that the fighter's going to think, I really fancy that. But is it a good fight for him? Probably not. He could probably do with another few defences and, and step himself up. I think he'd be going in as a massive underdog and uh, he will struggle in that fight. So um, I, can, I can totally understand why they want it and why he would want it personally. Yeah. But whether it's a good fight or not, I don't think so. Possibly possibly a bit too early for Smith. Smith only got 22, um, 23 fights on, uh, as a professional under his belt, despite the fact that he's two years older than Avaris, who's got 46 with one defeat, of course, to Mayweather. Was it last year or the year before last? Yeah, year before last, yeah. But you have to look at levels. Uh, he's, like, he's been fighting at the top level for the last two or three years, um, whereas Smith hasn't fought anywhere near that level. Yes, he's picked up a world title, but... Still, many will argue that he hasn't he hasn't faced any world class opposition. Well, I don't think we'll see. I personally don't think we'll see that fight anytime soon. But is it a very similar situation to the the Billy Joe Saunders Golovkin offer? Now, it was reported that Billy Joe Saunders was was offered three point two million dollars to face Golovkin. That surely is enough money to to get him out, isn't it? Um, if it's true, it would be. Um, I'm not. 100% convinced that those two could, could generate that sort of money. Um, in the States, can they push? It's a big question. Would they sell out? Yeah, they'd probably sell out, but are they going to get a stadium big enough? Are they going to get enough TV interest? I don't know. Um, I think Frank Warren's mentioned over here that, that until summer, there's definitely no way they could generate anywhere near that sort of money over here. Mm. Um, so is that is that realistic? I don't know. Um but Golovka, I mean, Billy just Saunders has only just won a world title fight. You would expect him to get a couple of defences under his belt. He's had a tough couple of years. It's a while since Billy just Saunders fought somebody that's actually been beaten. Another British heavyweight uh, in the news this week. Derek Chisora, of course, recently signed with Sauerland Promotions in Germany, has called out Dillian White. Now, Dillian's just uh, recovering from a shoulder surgery and he won't be back out until around about May, June is what he told me yesterday. Now, that's a, that's a great fight though, isn't it? When, when both are fit, when both are, are available, that looks like a cracking fight for British heavyweight boxing. Definitely, definitely. I mean, if, if the Chisora of the, the, the same Chisora can turn up, the guy that pushed clicks go can turn up, then um, it is a great fight. Um, Derek on his day is a good boxer, he's got good power, he's got good movement, You'd probably, in, if you look at both their records and you look at what they've done in the past, you would edge it with Chisora, but the problem with Chisora is that he's kind of gone downhill a little bit as of late. Um, since that Tyson Fury fight, he's never really picked himself up. Um, and he's gone in with some very limited opposition and blasted the mail, of course, but he doesn't seem to have the same hunger. Maybe a fight with Dillian White, he'll bring that hunger back and we'll see the best of Derek Chisora again. Well, I don't think that fight, if it does happen, will be till the end of this year because Dillian obviously wants to, uh, with, with so much inactivity due to the so- shoulder surgery, he'll want to get a couple of warm-up fights first. OK, looking ahead to next week, Frank Warren has an event on at the York Hall. Uh, it's a British featherweight title fight between Ryan Walsh and Darren Trainor. How do you see that one going, John? It's an interesting fight. Um, I, I guess a lot of it's how much Trainor can bring to the table. He was a decent amateur. He's 11 and hours a pro. Um, but he's, he's only really faced limited opposition. I think his, his best win has to be against David Savage. David Savage is not bad. He took David Savage out in the sixth round. But apart from that, I think it's the only positive record opponent he's actually faced. OK, and also on that, that bill is uh, an IBF international super welterweight uh, fight between Ahmed Patterson, who's a rising prospect, and Ryan Aston. Uh, I don't know too much about Ryan Aston. I know Ahmed Patterson from his time when he beat Chad Gaynor, which is a great win for him, um, just over a, a year ago, I think it was now. 
Yeah. Um, in regard to Ryan Aston, he's not bad. He's another. He's another awkward southpaw. Uh, he's won his last three. Um, he lost out on points to Jason Wellborn. I don't know if you've heard Jason Wellborn, but he's been yeah. with the likes of Matthew Macklin, Frankie Gavin, Liam Smith. Um, and he gave him a decent fight despite losing to Wellborn. I think, obviously, Patterson has to be a massive favourite. But uh, Ryan Aston's no mug. I think he can fight. I think he'll give him a decent, a decent run. <laughs> In Germany next weekend also, there's a WBO intercontinental belt. Defence for Dominic Berzel. Now, Berzel has defended this belt already about five or six times. Um, and you just get to wonder when he's going to move up um, and start or challenge possibly for a, a light heavyweight title. But he's 26 years old. He's 20 and 0. He's taking on Balaz Kellerman. Also a good record. 24 wins, one loss. That one loss was to Vincent Feigenbust, but he's twenty. Sorry, he's thirty-seven years old. The Hungarian Kellerman Berzo is only twenty-six, and he's always looked good. I've seen him a few times, Dominic Berzo. He looks very, very tidy. Nothing particularly special, but um, does does most things pretty well. Yeah, he impressed me when he when he fought Timmy Charla. Um, Timmy Charla was nineteen now, I think, at mm. the time. Um, good performance, as he said, twenty and now. Maybe it's time to start stepping up. Is Kellerman that guy? I don't think so. Yes, his record looks good. 21, 24 and 1, I think he is. Um, but it's mainly manufactured. It's mainly against limited opposition. Um, as you said, fights and books have come out in nine, in nine rounds. And that was his only loss. But to be honest, it's his only real step up on, the, on his record. Also in the news from Germany, Kala Sauerland was in the United States negotiating a purse bid for the Arthur Abraham Ramirez fight, and they won it. What do you think of that fight? Arthur's getting towards the, let's say, the twilight of his career. He's still fighting at the top level, though, and he's still winning. He is, yeah, he is still winning. Um, I think this is a tough one for him. I think Ramirez, it's obviously a step up from Ramirez. He's uh, 33-0 now, I think. Um, He's got some good wins under his belt. He's a tall, rangy southpaw. Um... For me, he's got a few range issues that, that Abrahams will probably be looking to take advantage of. He's a little bit open to the right hand. He can overstep his mark a little bit and get a little bit too close, which would obviously benefit Abraham. I think winning the post bids is, was big for them, I think, because um, if they're going to be in charge of who the judges are and stuff, I think with Abrahams, the way he wins rounds is he lands three or four solid punches and probably takes ten light punches in response. Yeah, But he's winning them rounds, and I think... This is going to be a very similar fight. I think Ramirez is going to be busier of the two. I think he's going to box him, and Abraham's are going to Abraham is going to land the occasional solid hard shot. It'd be interesting how Ramirez takes that, but um, I think it's a tough one for Abraham. Probably the biggest fight next week has got to be Danny Garcia against Robert Guerrero, hasn't it? That's a, that's a cracking fight, that one. Yeah, I think that's a cracking fight. Um, Danny Garcia is obviously 31 and 0, and he's, I think he's been a little bit lucky, though. He's had a few close decisions that have gone his way. Lamont Peterson, uh, Mauricio Herrero, even Ashley Theophane. I mean, I remember Ashley Theophane is fighting Adrian Broner soon. Yeah. Um, Give him a very, very tough fight in Florida, and um, a lot of the Florida crowd were booing when it was announced Danny Garcia's win by split decision. Um, he had a close one with Matese, he had a close one with Judah. I think if he knocked, he's, got, he's obviously got power. Um, but if he doesn't knock out Guerrero, who's very tough, um, he could be in a little bit of trouble. Nice to talk to you today, John. Great, um, great coverage from your side, from a trainer's point of view. For the fights, we'll be back next week with episode three of the Tony Boxing Podcast. And we're hoping to get Kala Sauerland on to talk about the recent purse bid win for Arthur Abraham. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye.